Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would like to uh, make a special thanks to all these people who have helped me uh, to prepare uh, and to find cases because this is, this is a subject that is not easy. And especially uh, my friend Eva Castaner, who's sitting there and who, from whom I borrowed, quote unquote, several cases and, uh, and drawings, as you will see. And I also want to mention this uh, very good book that was published in 2012 by a group of uh, colleagues from uh, international colleagues, but especially from Tunisia, and that I recommend because uh, I don't have any bonds in this company. But I really think this is an extremely nice book about this. Uh, the objectives are very clear, uh, to learn about different types of large, uh, cell, large, large vessel vasculitis, to become familiar with the histopathological correlates in vasculitis, to appreciate the different manifestations and imaging appearances of these uh, diseases, and to understand the role of radiology. Now, what, what, uh, vasculitis is a confusing world. The experts in vasculitis in my hospital are nephrologists, rheumatologists, internists, pathologists, ophthalmologists, and probably uh, vascular surgeons, which means different approaches, different names, different classifications. Uh, this is a confusing nomenclature and confusing, many other confusing things in vasculitis. For example, Wegener granulomatosis now is called granulomatosis with polyangitis, mainly because this uh, man was a Nazi party member, very active, and uh, the name has been uh, excluded, although it remains in our memory. Uh, and another interesting thing is there are no true granulomas in this disease, although it's called granulomatosis. And there are several forms of Wegener. Schuch Strauss, as we have seen in the previous lecture, is now called eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis. And there are also different pathologic uh, manifestations of it. So pulmonary vasculitis are rare diseases, difficult in the diagnosis, and they have a wide spectrum of imaging findings. As you can see here, the incidence of these diseases is extremely low. As you, as more, uh, pulmonary fibrosis is 10 times more frequent than this type of vasculitis. And the diagnosis is difficult because there are multi-systemic symptoms, there are uh, multiple uh, pulmonary manifestations, uh, other symptoms of other organs like the kidneys and sinusitis, etc. And why do we need to classify? For two things, because we need, uh, for research, we need to have the groups extremely well uh, uh, def defined, and also for clinical purposes, because the doctor, the clinician has to know how to treat the patients and what, treat, what patients to be treated. So the classifications have been going on since uh, 1952, and the last one was around 2012 with the Chapel Hill update. Now, with this drawing from Eva Castaner, from his, her article in radiographics, you can see that they are classified in large vessels, middle vessels, and small vessels. And I'm lucky because I'm talking about the large vessel vasculitis, which is more simple. This is the last Chapel Hill classification, and you see here how vasculitis, vasculitis of the large vessels is defined. It's defined as vasculitis affecting large arteries more often than other vasculitis. Large arteries are the aorta and its major branches, but any size artery may be affected. This is important. We have to remember that. And the two main ones are Takayasu and Giant Cell, although Betset is also included in the classification. So the classification of uh, the large vessel vasculitis, the classification is not complicated. The pathology is mainly inflammatory, granulomatous. The clinical diagnosis is difficult early in, in the early uh, phases because it's nonspecific. The frequency is rare, it's uh, quite unfrequent, although giant cell uh, arteritis is more common. And imaging mainly remains in looking at the vessel and at the wall of the vessel. And we use all these techniques, but as you can see, chest uh, radiograph and CT is mainly used for looking at the parenchyma, while CT, ultrasound, angiography, MRI, and PET CT will give us information about the vessels, the lumen, and the wall of the vessels. And this is what happens in vasculitis. There is a, a inflammation of the vessel wall, as you can see here, and the translation of that uh, inflammation with thickening is seen in the images. And uh, later on, some of the vessels will be completely occluded, as you can see in this path uh, uh, photograph, and then we will see the translation in imaging as a vessel that is occluded. And uh, we then have to look at the lumen with different techniques, regular angiography, uh, uh, CT angiography, 
or MRI, as uh, we see here. And uh, in the MRI, you see that we are uh, showing, in this case, how the wall can be not only thickened, but may have conscious uptake. Techniques that look, uh, that look also at the wall of the vessels are ultrasound, which is very good for vessels that are reachable by ultrasound, and obviously CT. So if we compare the different techniques for uh, looking at uh, uh, large vessel vasculitis, we'll see that for morphology of the vessel, for the lumen, and geography is excellent, US Doppler is excellent, CT is good, MRI is good, but PET is not very good. And to the contrary, inflammation is not very well seen, but is not seen by angiography, but is seen much better with the other techniques. Especially PET-CT now is uh, very much uh, used uh, uh, in, uh, in vasculitis of the uh, large vessels. And the sensitivity of uh, PET-CT is around uh, between 77 and 92 percent, and the specificity of between 80 and 100 percent. And what we look for is this uh, uptake in the wall of the vessel, and uh, we usually, uh, or the nuclear medicine, uh, usually have to look at the distribution, the uptake pattern, and the intensity. And one good uh, thing is use a semi-quantitative method and look at the intensity of the uptake relative to the liver, because uh, sometimes we will confuse that with atherosclerosis, which may show some increase in uptake. And geography is not only good for diagnosis, but may, use, may be used especially for interventional techniques to uh, relieve this uh, stenosis or occlusions. And uh, to use uh, stents, like in this one, by the way, this was not very well put because there is some stent here hanging down, but this is a case of Takayasu arteritis with a stent in the right innominate uh, vein, uh, artery. So Takayasu is a, a nonspecific chronic inflammatory arteriopathy that uh, affects mainly the aorta and branches and sometimes the pulmonary arteries and gives stenosis and aneurysm. It's mainly in Japan, Southeast Asia, Mexico, and in the following of the Silk Road. Uh, mainly affects young women, and this is important, the age, and the etiology is not very well known. And this is, again, a drawing by, uh, from the uh, article of Eva Castaner, where you see this proliferation, this inflammation of the wall that uh, tends to stenose the vessel. There are uh, giant cells, granulomatosis, and there's sclerosis, and they end up having calcification of the wall, as in this case, where you see not only the aorta, but also the pulmonary arteries with calcifications. And uh, Takayasu will give a, an initial phase with general systemic symptoms, malaise, arthritis, and other symptoms like this, which are very nonspecific, and then an occlusive phase where you will have vascular occlusive symptoms. And depending on the vessel that is occluded, you will have different symptomatology. It's interesting to, to see that Takayasu and also giant cell arteritis are segmental, are relapsing, and are transmural in the pathology. And that reminds me a lot of another disease, which is Crohn's disease, which is segmental, relapsing, and transmural. And it's also, an auto, in a way, it's a, an autoimmune disease. We may use angiography to stage or to classify uh, Takayasu's arteritis, and there are different classifications, like this one here, or another classification related more to the symptomatology. In imaging, Takayasu, we will look in the acute inflammatory phase. If we suspect it, we have to look for the walls of the vessels, and we will see enhancement in the early and the late images in CT and MR. And in the late phase, we will look for occlusions of the vessels, stenosis, and alterations of, of the contour. This is a case of Takayasu where we see uh, this uh, thickening of the femoral artery in this right side, if you compare it with the left. And this uh, changes in the mediastinal fat, which also occur with this inflammatory process. Also, you see the aorta and the uh, celiac trunk uh, involved by this disease. And in, in the MRI, you see the thickening of the wall. In this case, you can see it very well. And in uh, PET-CT, as I mentioned, we will see uptake of uh, 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 more activity uh, of uh, glucose in the walls of the different vessels, and we can actually find uh, the extension of the disease. In late phases of Takayasu, we, uh, you may have stenosis and aneurysm or dilatations with calcifications of the walls. 
And it's interesting also that has been reported that in late phases of Takayasu, you will have in MRI, you may have an enhancement of the wall of the vessels, especially of the aorta. Uh, interventional radiology may be interesting for Takayasu, especially when medical uh, treatment doesn't work uh, and uh, angioplasty and, and stents are uh, uh, used for this purpose. The only thing you have to remember is that the risk stenosis is frequent, around 40%. And uh, usually uh, we follow the advice of these authors that say that uh, if you are going to do a dilatation or put a stent, you have to do it with, uh, in a clinically inactive dis uh, di uh, phase of the disease with a low uh, er erythrocyte uh, sedimentation rate and with an intimal medial uh, uh, complex stable. So those will be the indications for this type of treatment. The pulmonary arteries may be involved in Takayasu in around 10, 15% of the cases, up to 20 in some series. And usually you will see proximal stenosis, distal stenosis, and also there may be an arteriolitis, as mentioned in the previous talk, in the peripheral lung that can give you uh, things like mosaic pattern, etc. And this will, be this, uh, will give these symptoms. Here you see this case where the left pulmonary artery is stenosed. Again, look at the mediastinal fat and look in the sagittal view, the thickening of the wall of this uh, pulmonary artery in a Takayasu patient. And this is, uh, again, the case by, uh, from Eva Castaner where you see the late phase of Takayasu with the stenosis in the pulmonary arteries and also the calcification in the walls uh, due to these intimal uh, changes. Now, here is a 77-year-old uh, uh, patient with dyspnea and chest pain. And we are seeing changes as the ones I sh mentioned before. A little calcification here could be atherosclerotic, but there is an, uh, a thickening of the wall, and there is an enhancement of the wall in the late phase. This cannot be Takayasu because it's, she's 77 years old. This is giant cell arthritis for that reason and because, because it's also a more common disease. And giant cell arthritis in, uh, pathologically is very similar to Takayasu. And you will have all the changes that I mentioned in the previous slides about pathology. Uh, in the aorta, the adventitia and the media are involved. And uh, in the branches of the aorta, usually there is an intimal proliferation. This is why there is a tendency to occlusion and stenosis of the branches, main branches of the aorta. Again, see that it's segmental, segmental and may have skip areas, which means that if we do a, a biopsy, sometimes the, the biopsy will be falsely negative because we will not hit in the place where the disease is. And uh, there are uh, several classical symptoms of giant cell arthritis, especially uh, in the head with mandibular, uh, mandibular claudication, headache, and uh, Finally, you may have blindness. And according to these five criteria, if you have three of them, you have a high sensitivity and specificity for the diagnosis of uh, giant cell arthritis. Here again, you see a non-contrast in arterial phase and a contrast uh, phase where you see the changes in the arterial wall. But of course, the uh, ultrasound and Doppler of the uh, temporal artery may give you the clue in many cases when you see this halo or macaroni sign surrounding the temporal artery, which translates this pathological change in the temporal artery. <clears throat> Again, uh, cases of giant cell arteritis with extreme uh, thickening of the arterial of the wall of the aorta, and even with some ulceration or irregularity of the aortic wall. And not uh, that unfrequently you may have in these patients, they may have aortic aneurysms. PET-CT will exactly show the same things I, I mentioned before in Takayasu with the a high uptake in the vessels that are involved in giant cell arteritis. Sometimes, because these people are older, we maybe get confused with atherosclerosis. And uh, some authors propose to, uh, to differentiate it according to this uh, chart here. In atherosclerosis, you may see some increased uh, glucose activity, but from zero to one SUV, while in vasculitis, it will be from two to, th to three. It will be more linear in vasculitis and more spot-like in uh, atherosclerosis. And again, as I mentioned before, if you compare with the liver, that may also help you uh, differentiate one from the other. 
This is a, a woman of uh, 26 years old who has Bessette uh, syndrome for three years, and now she, she has dyspnea. This is a previous uh, chest X-ray, which was considered normal, and uh, you see uh, one year later, or seven, several months later, that uh, there has been a change when she has dyspnea, and you see the hyla are larger. And this is Vetsit. And this is the involvement or vascular Vetsit uh, of the pulmonary arteries, where you, uh, these patients develop aneurysms and thrombosis in the arteries. Not only there, but also there's a high tendency to venous thrombosis. And here you see a thrombus in the right atrium. And uh, these are the main uh, things you will, you will see in this, uh, this disease. Now, you see uh, recur recurrent oral genital ulcers and uveitis. So here you have a clinical scenario which is more clear than in the previous diseases. And in the thorax, you may see 8 to 20% of the cases involvement of the veins, the arteries, the vena cava, etc. Uh, so the, uh, these are changes that you may see in Betzet. This is another case where you see alterations in the diameter of the pulmonary arteries, but also, if you look carefully, you see some consolidations, some lesions in the lungs. This look like infarcts, and may be infarcts, but may also be areas of hemorrhage, of pneumonia, or atelectasis, as described in the literature. And also, small vessel vasculitis in the lungs may produce a mosaic pattern. Also interesting in Betsit is that when they give immunosuppressive treatment, you may have a good evolution of the disease. And in this case, uh, you see how the uh, pulmonary arteries were before the treatment, and after the treatment, there is partial recanalization of the pulmonary arteries. So uh, in summary, these three diseases, you see that uh, Takayasu is uh, in young people. The uh, clinical symptoms are uh, not, not very specific. And the incidence is 0 to 0.2 per 100,000. Giant cell arteritis is above 50. It's in older people. Again, the symptoms are not very clear, although may, you may have head symptoms or more localized in the head. And the incidence is 15 per 100,000. It's much more common. And uh, Betzet uh, is in also usually in young, in young people. You may, and you have the clinical signs or the clinical presentation of, uh, of Betzet, except in the hugh stobin uh, uh, syndrome, where you may have uh, is a form first of uh, Betzet's disease. And in 10% of the cases, you may have involvement of the pulmonary arteries and of the veins uh, in the thorax. Now, <clears throat> I add here one, uh, and this is Wegener, where you see in this case a stenosis of the pulmonary arteries and involvement with some dilatations. This is extremely rare. And what I want to see, to, uh, to stress now, is that we may have many other diseases that produce uh, uh, things like this. And this in, indeed, as I, uh, as I was mentioning, this is the case of a 31-year-old woman who had right heart uh, problems and had pulmonary nodules and masses and uh, presented with this uh, CT where we saw this alteration in the mediastinal uh, fat and also the stenosis in the pulmonary arteries. And this was uh, a, Ve a Wegener's case of, uh, of uh, disease involving, exactly like this one that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2008. It's exactly a copy of that, uh, of that case. Very rare, but it may occur. Or this other case we have had recently in our department of a, a patient who has also pulmonary masses, some of them with necrosis inside, and has thickening, extreme thickening of the entire aorta. And it's another Wegener giving a kind of vasculitis, uh, 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 unusual vasculitis for this disease. Or this other case of a 37-year-old who had HIV infection had multiple pulmonary aneurysms. And this is vasculitis asso associated to HIV, which also may occur and give pulmonary hypertension or pulmonary aneurysms. Or lastly, this case that was lent to me by Jose Cáceres, where this patient presented with a, uh, the aorta completely uh, coated by uh, um, a tissue involving the entire aorta and had some changes in the lungs with infiltration of the interstitium, as we can see here, and pathologic uh, uh, bone scan. And this is 
a coated aorta or is Erdheim Chester disease, which is a uh, non langerhans histiocytosis with uh, involvement of different tissues of the body. Very rare, but it may occur. Or lastly, this lady that came to our hospital with chest pain in previous surgery, and we saw these calcifications over the heart, and actually this was a tremendous, enormous aneurysm of the coronary arteries. Some of them were completely thrombosed. This was a Kawasaki of childhood, probably, that had evolved. But these are extremely rare diseases. What are the uh, future directions of vasculitis in this, uh, regarding what I'm talking about? Well, in the diagnosis and classification, there is uh, also a project that is going on. There is uh, genomic studies, and also try, people are trying to uh, develop predictive markers. There is a lot of discussion about the use of uh, PET-CT, as I showed you before. And this, uh, especially this group in rheumatology uh, journals uh, published a paper where they end up saying that there's no significant correlation, there was no significant correlation in their study between the FDG uptake, the vascular thickening, gadolinium uptake, or wall edema in their patients. So there's uh, contradictory information right now. But it's true that in the, in the practice now, at least in our case, we see that uh, patients like this one who had uh, uh, giant cell arteritis, you see the involvement, clear involvement in PET-CT of the wall of the aorta, and one, uh, one month after methotrexate, you see how all that has disappeared. So we are seeing something happening or something disappearing, and I think probably in the future this will be uh, useful. Other things that are being done are, is, uh, are to try to find other things, uh, other uh, markers that can be used to mark uh, granulocytes uh, in, the, uh, in the vasculitis or targeting the inflammatory enzyme myeloperoxidase in this article of radiology, not uh, very old. And this one, very recent, of a group using uh, drug, uh, drug uh, stents and balloons to treat stenosis in Takayasu's arteritis to avoid that restenosis that I mentioned before. So in conclusion, what do I think is, uh, is the role of radiology in large vessel vasculitis? One, or what are the common situations? One is when there is a clinical suspicion of vasculitis, and then they ask, the clinicians will ask us, and we will try to find or look at the signs I mentioned and I showed you before. Two is the serendipitous diagnosis. is when we are doing a study and we find things that we, uh, will suggest us that probably the patient could have a vasculitis. And this will be the case here. Three is the evaluation of the extent of the disease. And I think in that sense, angiographic uh, techniques, uh, CT, MRI, uh, will be very useful to, or even PET-CT, to evaluate the extent of the disease. Four, interventional treatment, as I mentioned, where we can, our radiologists, interventional radiologists can do a lot of things. And finally, follow up after therapy, as I just showed you in that slide, previous slide. And uh, I think that to conclude, large vessel vasculitis are unfrequent diseases. The initial diagnosis is difficult because there are, non -speci there are no specific symptoms in the majority except uh, in Betsit. Takayasu and giant cell arteritis have a similar pathological ground, and the age is the distinguishing factor. Imagine must combine morphological information, the lumen, and analysis of the vessel wall. The aorta and the main branches are usually involved, but smaller vessels can also be affected. And finally, the pulmonary arteries can be involved in 50% of Takayasu and in vascular vessel. And of course, exceptionally, you may find other diseases that will produce the same uh, findings. Thank you very much.